All right, so we're at the point in the class where we're more or less done learning modeling techniques. Uh, now we're going to be getting into materials and textures, and going along with that is uh, cameras and lights and render settings. They all kind of work hand in hand to give you a nice, beautiful, finished product. Uh, I know I said I was going to talk about materials and textures today. It's going to skew more towards materials, cameras, and lights. Uh, because if you don't have a camera and a light set up, then you can't really tell how good your textures are. So uh, let's start. Uh, here's our default scene. So in our default scene, uh, we start with three things. We start with a cube, a light, and a camera. And up until now, we've only worried about the cube. Well, now we're going to start talking about the other two things. Um, so we've got a light, which allows us to see what's in our scene, and we have our camera which does the seeing. If I hit zero on the number pad, I go into my camera view, if there's a camera added. Uh, I can see right up here on the top left, I've got camera perspective highlighted. And what this means, what the camera's looking at, that's what's going to render when I hit render. How do I render? I'm glad you asked. Uh, up here there's the render menu. You've got render image and render animation. Uh, render image will render that frame, uh, whatever frame you're on. Render animation will render the whole selection of frames uh, that you have set for your animation. You can also render uh, in our properties over here, the first uh, pane, the camera is your render settings, and this first chunk right here, we've got render, this will render the image, animation will render the whole uh, animation, and then play is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, so if I hit render right away, this is what I get. We see the light is casting light on the top and the side of our cube, and our camera is picking that up. Um, a Blender has kind of three render engines incorporated into it, and render engines are they're they're kind of they're programs that that tell Blender how to interpret the objects and the attributes that you have set up in your scene. So it'll it'll take a light and it'll take an object and it'll kind of figure out what that light is doing that, to that object and how the camera perceives it. So by default, uh, it's set to Blender Render, which is referred to as the internal render engine. It's the one Blender has had for quite a few years. Uh, it is a what's called a progressive uh, scanline renderer. It's not great. It's good for some things. It tends to be pretty fast. Um, but it's not very realistic, and it's where Blender is moving away from that as the default. I believe when uh, when Blender uh, 2.7 comes out, I believe Cycles is going to be the default renderer. Um, Cycles is the new new renderer. It's been around for I don't know a year and a half or so. Um, it's a much more realistic renderer, and that's what we're going to be focusing focusing on in this class. Uh, and the third one is the Blender game engine. Uh, Blender has an internal game engine. Uh, it programs in Python. Uh, there's a few different ways you can interact with it. We won't be covering that in this class, but it is there um, if you're interested in exploring it. So we want to render with the Cycles Render engine. So in this top uh, drop down, I'm going to select Cycles Render. And I'm going to hit Render again. And you can see immediately there is a difference. Um, can't tell much of a difference with the default scene, but it does render a much more accurate, uh, accurately lit scene. You'll also notice uh, some of the settings here on the side have changed with the Cycles render engine. Uh, Cycles is a physically based renderer, um, and as such, you've got options for light paths and uh, a few other things that kind of affect how the render engine works. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert on how render engines work, but I do know Cycles is just, it's better, it looks nicer, um, just in general. And we will see that as we move forward. Um, so these are our, our basic render settings. Um, we've got our render button here. I'm going to hit escape to get out of uh, the rendered view. Uh, the next section is our dimensions. We've got a bunch of presets. Um, oops. Well, you've got your resolution which is the overall resolution, and then you've got a, a, a percentage slider. Uh, and this is useful for if you just want to do previews, um, you can just set it to 50% of the, 
of your full 1920 by 1080, which will render out uh, 960 by 540, uh, faster render for, for, you know, like I said, previews. Um, over here we have the frame range, so if you're doing an animation, you can define your start and end frames. Um, and if you just want to render, say, every fifth frame, because you're doing a, just like a, a previs, and you just want to get a sense for how things are, are working and flowing together, you have that option as well. You can choose your frame rate. I've got all the different standards, uh, 2398, 24, 25, if you're uh, doing PAL. Uh, and then you can also do a custom frame rate as well. Uh, aspect ratio is, I believe, refers to, yeah, the pixel aspect ratio. In general, we'll keep that at one. Um, you can also have a border. Um, you can actually define just a, a specified um, kind of a square area to render. If you're just testing, you know, if you're just altering the materials on one little little part of the scene, you don't need to render out the whole scene. You can define a, a smaller border just to, run, to render that out. Um, uh, the next important section to worry about is the output. This is where it'll render to. So by default, it renders out to a temporary folder. Um, you can define exactly where you want it to render to. When you're doing animations, you need to, you need to define it beforehand. If you're just rendering out stills, uh, if I render, I've got my image menu. I can save it out from here. I can click Save as Image. I can choose my location, and also I can choose my format if I want to do PNG, JPEG, um, you know, TIFF. I can choose my compression. I can choose my color depth. If I want to have an alpha channel in there, I can choose that as well. Um, and again, I have all those options here. Uh, in the in the preferences menu, I also have uh, the motion options. Although when we do uh, when we actually get into rendering animations, the way that we're going to render animations is we'll actually do it frame by frame and, and save each frame as its own image. Uh, the advantage there is if and probably when Blender crashes while you're rendering an animation that takes five or six or seven hours, if you render it out as an animation, um, it will lose, you'll lose the whole thing if it crashes. If you render out as separate uh, image files, then you only lose whatever individual frame it was working on, all the previous images, frames have been saved, and you can pick up from where you left off. It also means that, um, you know, if you're, if you're working at home and you have a lot of work to do on your computer and you can't afford to have it rendering in the background all the time, you can just render out a chunk of your animation, and when that's done, you can, you know, do whatever work you need to do, and then before you go to bed at night, set it up to render out the next chunk. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, lock your computer up for 15 hours at a time. Okay, so that is the output section. Um, the next one that is particularly useful is the sampling pane, um, and especially these two options right here, render samples and preview samples. So if I hit, uh, or if I go right down here and change my viewport shading to rendered, um, I can select my cube and rotate around it, and it will live render with cycles uh, in the viewport. Now you can't really see any difference in quality right now, um, but if you notice up here, this 10 out of 10, it's rendering those uh, samples on the fly. So if I center my cursor and add in a plane, scale that up, and let's move that up so it's sitting on the, on the ground. Okay. So it'll, it'll render its 10 samples, and it still looks a little bit noisy. If I up the preview samples to, say, 50, it's going to render more, and it's going to smooth it out. Um, and you can bump that up to 1,000 samples if you want, or 2,000. You could render out 10,000 samples. It'll take a while, especially if you have a complicated scene. But you can, that's how one of the ways that you can adjust how much noise um, is in the render. Um, so those are the render samples. Uh, you've got some film options, exposure. Um, you can check your performance settings here. Um, normally, you keep it on auto detect. All, all of these, not all of these, most of these computers have, uh, you'll be able to do 24 threads uh, at a time. Um, so that's the basics for the render settings. Um, you can also. Uh, 
there's a there's a hotkey for rendering by default in Blender. It is F11 to render a single frame. Um, however, on these computers, I've got custom hotkeys set up. Uh, if you have a slim Apple keyboard, the hotkey to render a single frame is F18. Um, if you have a fat keyboard, the default hotkey is F16. Um, so. Not too many of you have the fat keyboards, but if you do, that's what it is. You can also check and change if you go into your uh, user preferences, input, um, screen, global, and then scroll down to render, and you can see whatever it's set at uh, for your particular keyboard. Um, I'm going to go back to normal solid view. Um, again, when I render, it's going to pop up. Um, by default, it'll pop up the image editor, and to get out of it, I can just hit escape to go back to my 3D view. I can also change what, what pops up. I can have it open up in a new window. So now when I render, as you would expect, a new window. Uh, and then you can also choose full screen uh, or keep UI, which renders it, doesn't actually show it to you because I don't have a render view open. Um, but I'll keep it on image editor for now. Uh, so those are, that's the very basic overview of the render settings. Uh, next, let's talk about the camera settings. So I'm going to select this camera, the default camera. I'm going to hit uh, zero on the number pad to go into camera view. Uh, when I have the camera selected, over in my properties, I now have a camera icon that will adjust the camera properties. And first we have lens options. So we have a perspective view, we have an orthographic view, uh, and we have a panoramic view. Uh, we'll generally be keeping things at perspective, except for uh, specific use cases. Uh, and then with perspective, you have a focal length. This behaves as a real camera would. So 35 millimeters is what your eye sees, basically. Um, if you change it to 50, 50 is what's called a standard lens length, okay, and that is basically working like a zoom. Uh, you can, you know, go all the way in, you can zoom out and get a kind of distorted fisheye look. Uh, so you can play around with that and get, get the, whoops, get the view that you need. Uh, clipping, start and end, what this refers to is the camera is only seeing a certain depth anything past 100 blender units the camera isn't going to see so if you have a particularly large scene you may need to bump up the clipping end to um, you know a thousand or two thousand um, just to make sure everything is in frame you've got some camera presets 5d 7d red epic um, the blender default camera so you can play around with that uh, and the sensor size I generally don't adjust that too much the, the default camera seems to work pretty fine for all of my needs at this point. Uh, and then there's a few other options. There's some depth of field options which we'll uh, get to eventually. Uh, just things to be aware of. Um, now, for positioning your camera, if I hit N to bring up my properties. And let me find it. Okay. It, we've got you know, in the view panel, we've got this option lock camera to view. So by, with, before I check that, if I want to move the camera around, I can select the camera and then I can hit G and move it however I want. I can hit G and uh, X and move it side to side. If I hit G and double tap, double tap X, it'll move it along the local X axis, so the camera's X axis, if I want to move it side to side. But if I check lock camera to view, now I can navigate my camera the same way that I would the 3D view. Okay, and it makes it very easy to get uh, the camera lined up exactly where I want it to be. Okay, and then I can uncheck that uh, when I got it where I want it. Uh, another option you have is you can just navigate your view around however you would like, kind of figure out where you want your uh, camera, and then if you go to view, cameras, uh, no it's not cameras, it's a line view, 
uh, align active camera to view, which is the shortcut is Control Alt Number Pad Zero. Uh, that will pop the camera to whatever my view is. Uh, and then if you just want to really quickly dolly your camera in and out, select your camera, camera, hit G, and then double tap Z, and you can push in and out uh, to line it up the way you want. Uh, so those are the basics of moving your camera around and try to get your get your scene established the way that you want. So now I want to cover a very brief overview of lighting. Uh, there are kind of three main ways that you can add light to your scene. And the first is just with a light object, which is what this is by default. So this is a point lamp. Um, if I delete that and hit shift A and go down to lamp. I have five options. I have a point lamp, a sun lamp, a spot, a hemisphere, and an area lamp. Um, let's start with the point lamp, even though I just deleted it. Uh, we'll move it back. So what this is, is this is light that emanates from a single point, which doesn't actually exist in real life. Um, they can be, they're useful for like kind of accents and, and things like that. Um, in general, I don't, I don't tend to use them because they are unrealistic. The closest thing we have to a point lamp is the sun, because the sun is far enough away that it, it acts pretty close to a point lamp. Um, but a point lamp will shine in all directions. If I uh, go back to rendered view and move the lamp around, you can kind of see how it affects and how it interacts with the world. Um, I've uh, once again have options for this lamp. I can preview what it does. Um, I've got I can change the size of the lamp, um, and then I've got options to change the color, and I have options to change the strength. I can turn it way down. I can turn it way up. And I can turn it up to twelve thousand if I want to, and just go nuclear. Um, the next type of lamp that we have is a sun lamp. So when you add a lamp, um, you can change the type just in the lamp properties. It won't change the name of the lamp, so I just changed it to a sun lamp, but the object itself still says it's a point lamp. So just be aware of that um, as you're messing around with things. If you start adding more lamps and don't rename them, you'll have five lights that might say point lamp, even though only one of them is actually a point lamp. So um, again, this is where naming becomes very important. The sun lamp is a, uh, a special lamp uh, for a couple of reasons. So the thing about the sun lamp is it doesn't matter where the location, where you put the sun lamp in the scene, okay? Because the way the sun works in real life is that all the light beams basically shine in the same direction from our, per from our perspective here on Earth. So the sun lamp works the same way. Uh, no matter where I put it, I could put it kind of on this side of the box. And if I go back into my rendered view, uh, first of all, this is way too powerful. And let's bring that back to white and bring that back down to one. Okay. So no matter where I put it in the scene, it's on this side of the lamp, uh, uh, of the box. So you would think with a normal light, the opposite side of the box would be in shadow. Not the case with the sun lamp. I can put I can put the sun beneath the plane, and I'm still going to get light in the whole scene. Okay. What this line indicates it indicates the direction that the sun is shining, but it the sun will shine just kind of globally on the whole scene. Okay. There is no real discernible point of origin. It's just light coming in that direction. Um, if I move it up and, and I'll rotate it around and kind of zoom in here. So there's our sun lamp. Uh, it's very cool and useful for kind of just a global, it, you know, if you have an outdoor scene, there's your key light. Very obvious. Um, with in Blender or any 3D application, the, the principles of light still apply. Um, so the nice thing, though, about working in 3D with lights is that you can have lights not cast shadows if you don't want them to. Um, so right here with the sun lamp, I can 
uh, unchecked cast shadow, and now it's not casting any shadow. It's still adding light, but it's not adding any shadows. So you can do kind of you can do things with lights in 3D that you can't do in real life. Um, you can also have a negative light, so it's, it'll actually take light away from the scene, which is kind of a weird thing, um, but it's an option. So that's the sunlight. Uh, the next we have a spotlight. Spotlight works as you would expect. It's got a point of origin, it has a direction, and then we've got this, uh, this panel here, spot shape. So you can change the size, if you want it more narrow, or really wide, um, and then you have this blend option, which is how hard the, the edge of the light is. So if I expand preview, uh, let's bring the strength way up so you can see it in the preview. I'll bring it up to 100. Okay. So as I adjust this blend, if I bring it all the way down, we've got a pretty hard edge. If I bring it all the way up, then we've got a really soft edge. So that's what blend does. Um, you can also click show cone so you can see exactly where this is hitting. Um, I generally keep that off. And again, you can adjust the size and uh, whether or not you want it to cast a shadow. So here's, here's the spotlight in the scene. Um, I might bring the emission up or the strength up even more. And bring the blend down so you can see the hard edge versus the softer edge. Okay, but it's still casting a hard shadow. Uh, next we have a, a hemisphere light, which is a particularly bright light. Uh, and that'll cast light all in one direction, um, as indicated. It's kind of kind of works like a sun lamp, except it does have a point of origin. So if I move it below the scene, it won't, you won't see the light. Uh, I don't use a hemisphere light a whole lot at all. And lastly, we have an area lamp, which is one I do use a lot. And an area lamp, um, for those of you who work with actual lights, is like a soft box. It's a large diffuse source. Um, by default, it actually starts uh, pretty small. I think it, it by default starts at 0.1. Um, but if I bring this up, let's say we'll, we'll bring it up to 5, now you can kind of see what the area lamp looks like. Um, and I'll go into my shaded view and bring up the strength. So, with this, we don't see any hard defined edges. We don't see hard edges of the light. We don't see hard edges of the shadow. And that also varies depending on the size of the source. Um, just like with real light, if we bring the size down to 0.1, we've got a really hard edge. If we bring the size up to 10, we have a very soft edge. So it's great for, for adding um, you know, fill light or just really subtle highlights that don't leave hard harsh shadows. Um, area lamps are great. So that's an overview of the lamp objects. There's those five types. Um, sun and area are probably in spot are the, the three that I use the most. Um, point has its uses. An hemisphere I just generally don't need. Um, but there are more ways to add light to the scene. Um, the next way that I'm going to talk about is through the world settings. So the world has color and light, just kind of ambient light. By default, it's this dark gray color. So if I render my scene, the world is this area back here. Okay, It's very blah, plain, neutral. I can change that color. I can lighten it up um, if I get out of that and go to my camera view and Go into rendered view. Okay, so now you can kind of visualize how changing the scene or the the world color affects the scene. I can make it darker. I can make it lighter. Um, and you know what? I'm going to add in a uh, a sun lamp again and just rotate a little bit. Okay, so we've got the sun is casting a white light and then you've got the world right now giving this kind of rust color to everything. Um, one of the really cool things about the world lighting is that you can actually give the world a texture. 
and you can apply an image to the world. And that's what I'm going to do right now because I think it's a it's an awesome way to kind of establish some base lighting for your scene. Um, so the way that you do that, uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to do this without getting into the node editor yet. Um, we'll get into the node editor maybe a little bit today, if not today, then next week. Um, but on on the surface option, you need to click use nodes, and then we have the surface option for background. If you click on that, um, no, I lied. It's not it's not the surface. It's the color. Click on the color um, the dot next to it, and then you can choose under texture, environment texture. And by default, you get this really wonderful shade of fluorescent purple uh, because it's telling you that it doesn't actually have an image currently loaded and set to be the environment texture. So I'm going to grab one. And the way that you can do this is if you go to search.creativecommons.org, uh, this is going to be a very wonderful, useful site for you as you start uh, doing textures. Um, because you can search any open source, you know, free to use and reuse um, image through all these different sources. Uh, and Flickr is a great source um, for the type of image that I'm about to search for. Uh, and that is called an equal rectangular um, image, which is spelled more or less like that. Equal rectangular. Okay. Now, when I uh, type that in and choose Flickr, because Flickr is a great source of images, it will search Flickr for images that match that, that description. And this is what those types of images look like. They're kind of a panoramic image with kind of a fisheye effect, but you've also got some pinching here as well. Uh, and I'm going to find one that I like. Um, let's say... We've got this train station. Okay, I'll choose that, and then over here on the side, I can click these three dots and view all sizes, and go to original because I want as large an image as possible. It's going to give me the most detail, and then I will right-click and save that image uh, to my desktop, and I will call it train station. Okay, so that's on my desktop now. Now I can jump back into Blender. And I can open up that image on my desktop, choose train station, and open image. Okay. Now in camera view, I can see that image is loaded into the background. Um, if I just rotate my, my view around normally, I can see it and I can pan around and see the entire environment. Um, if you are in orthographic view, you will only see random odd colors. You need to be in perspective view to actually see the image properly. Now. This is now giving light to the scene. And if I go and uh, turn off my sun, you can see all of the light that's hitting this cube right now is coming from the environment. It's the ambient light um, as determined by that background image being cast on the cube. And I can adjust the strength if I wanted to affect it more or less. You know, if I just want a very base level of light to kind of fill in the shadows and give it a sense of space and a sense of place, um, this is great for that. So this is, is another way to add light to a scene and a, a pretty common way to supplement light or, and to kind of fill out your scene and give it a little bit more texture and, and again, sense of place. Yeah, so when you have this, when you load a, a, a background image like, like this, you're basically texturing the world. So anything in your, or if you go to your camera view and you see it's not filled up by objects, and you see the background, then yes, that will render uh, in your final product. So could be useful. Usually the images don't feel right, and they're usually not. You'd have to have a pretty enormous resolution to get them to feel like they fit. Um, but if I had a, a backdrop behind this cube, and I was just using this as kind of an ambient kind of studio fill, that would work. Um, it's, it's still useful. Um, even if you don't want to see it in the, in the shot. And usually you don't want to see it in the shot. Um, so that is environment textures. The last way to add light to the scene is by um, adding a 
shader or a material to an object. Um, you can any any mesh object can emit light if you tell it to have a emission shader. Okay, and the way that that works, uh, I'm going to uh, let's see. We'll just disconnect that. Get rid of it for now. Um, okay, so let's say I'm going to add in a. Uh, UV sphere to the scene and I'm going to just move it up to the surface of the plane and I'll just move it over here okay so I've got a actually move it over here okay. and the Sun is still turned off okay. so I have this sphere that I just added to the scene and I want to make this a light make it make this emit light I'm going to go over to my uh, materials panel here, which is the, the circle icon, and add a new material. And here under surface, by default it's diffuse. I'm going to set that to emission. Okay. Now, uh, when I do that, and I change my viewport shading to rendered, you can see that it is now emitting light. And just like with a lamp object, I can adjust the color of it. I can adjust the strength of it, um, just like I would anything else. So you can have, you can use um, planes, and use those as big soft boxes or diffusion or you know big mesh lights. You can have orbs. Uh, I could add a monkey and make that emit light. Uh, it's a it's a very versatile and and um, kind of intuitive way to light a scene. Okay, so that's the third way to add light to your scene. Um, and again, with cycles, you can you can see the power of of cycles um, and how realistic this feels as an actual you know scene in, in a, a sense of place. Uh, just for comparison, I'll go back to the internal render engine, and I will set up this um, this sphere to have a similar material. Um, if I just we'll close that and do new and set up an emission material and this is what internal gives you it's terrible it's awful I hate it um, but cycles cycles looks awesome so emission I can set my color to whatever I want and that's just it's just a pleasing thing to do. Uh, so those are your lighting options. Um, this brings me to uh, materials in general. So we, we just added one material, which is an emission um, shader. Uh, let's look at all the other options. So I'm going to close this Blender file. And I've got this one whoops, prepared. So what, I've, what I did here is I have um, each object is actually four separate objects joined together. So there's a plane, a cube, a sphere, and a monkey. The sphere and the monkey both have um, sub subsurface modifiers applied to them um, at level two, and then I actually applied those uh, to them. And what I'm going to do is first I'm going to push this file to all of you. Um, I'll also put it up on D2L for those of you uh, who are not here today. So as this copies over, um, what we're going to end up doing is going through each, for each one of these, we're going to apply a different shader to it, a different material. Um, we're not going to worry about textures, but, we, but uh, we'll do different materials. Uh, and as, I hope you, you save it at least for a little bit, uh, because this will be a good reference just to go back to and see as an overview what each material does, what the effect each material has as you apply it. Um, so you, you have that as reference um, until you internalize and, and just remember what each one does. Um, we're 14% file transfer, so this might take a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to do is just one by one apply a material to each set of objects. So I'm going to start on this back one. and. 
over here on the side, I'm in my materials pane. I've, I've got cycles render uh, engine selected up here. I'm going to click new and it applies a new material. Now by default it's basically the exact same material as uh, what, what it already had. Um, and we're going to start with the diffuse shader. So the two kind of primary shaders that you'll be using, diffuse and specular. Diffuse is just kind of flat color. There is no specular highlight. There's no gloss, glare, reflection, anything like that. Um, it's just the color. So uh, I can choose a color the way that I normally would. Let's say I want to make this one, I don't know, a dark green. I can, I can choose that. Um, now, it won't, uh, in cycles, it won't update the viewport um, in standard um, solid view. I would have to go to settings and change the viewport color as well, which I can click the eyedropper and choose the color that I already chose. Um, but for this, I'm actually just going to work in uh, rendered view. So uh, change my viewport shading to rendered. The shortcut for that is Shift Z. We'll go into rendered. Uh, and you can see the basic scene is set up with the objects, a ground plane, uh, and then there's a sun lamp just to give some illumination. So pretty simple. Um, enough to kind of see the effect of the materials. So I think this color might be a little bit too dark. I'll, I'll bring that up. Um, you have a roughness, roughness option as well, which kind of further diffuses the light and softens it up. You can play around with that to see the effect. So this is a very basic, when you, when you apply very basic materials, this is it. It doesn't get any simpler than that. OK, so there's our simple material. Um, if you notice, a few times I've clicked a button that says Use Nodes. Um, and I bet none of you actually know what that means yet. Well, let me show you. I'm going to split my view. So if you remember, it's you got these three lines in the top right corner. Uh, mouse over them, your cursor will change to a plus. Click and drag down. I now have two views. I'm going to change this top view to the node editor. So we've got the menu right here in the bottom left. And I'm going to select node editor. And it brings this up. Um, I have been told that if any of you work in Animate Pro, there's something similar in that program as there is here. I have not worked in Animate Pro, so I can't speak to that. But um, you can blame Jared if, if that's not true. Uh, I'm going to hit N to hide my properties. So these are nodes. We've got this is an output node. This is a shader node. Um, I can move them around by left clicking and dragging on them, or I can hit G to move them around. Um, they are connected by a line, or what is called as, and I'm not making this up, a noodle. Um, I can left click and drag on either endpoint to disconnect it, or reconnect it, or move it to a different uh, option. And you can see that will dynamically affect the viewport shading. Um, when I'm over here on the side changing these options, what, it, what it's actually doing is changing these nodes, this node setup. Okay, so if I change the color here, uh, it's changing it up here as well. Uh, if I change it to a glass shader, it changes this node to a glass node. I'm going to change that back to the diffuse, however, and get back to a green that I don't hate. Um, now, the nodes might, might seem a little weird or, or tricky at first, um, but they actually make things flow a lot smoother uh, because you can see kind of visually how they're laid out and how they're connected. Whereas on the side here, you know, you, you have your surface and you have your displacement, but you don't really see how they relate to each other. The node editor allows that to happen. Now, these are two different types of nodes. There are a bunch more. Uh, so if I go into my Add menu here, I've got all these different categories of nodes. I can add different texture nodes, color nodes, uh, mapping, converter, um, know, all sorts of different inputs. Um, I can also do the same, hit Shift A and add a node and a node that I that I want. Okay. 
So this note editor right now, we're looking at material nodes. Um, there are different options or different types of, of node um, kind of sets or, or node editors. So right now we're in materials. And you can see that it indicated down here. If I go over one, um, this is the compositing nodes. And so what, what you can do here is once you render your image, um, let's say, OK, I hit F. Oh, I don't have a camera added. Um, you can add in um, you know, blur filters and um, glare filters. And, and basically do post-processing on your image um, in Blender through the node editor instead of having to go into Photoshop or anything like that. I also have texture nodes. Uh, and texture nodes are when we get into actually at applying textures to shaders. Um, that's where these will come in handy. And then I also have over here, um, I've got world nodes. So when I was before uh, adding a background image, what I was actually doing is adding in uh, nodes here. So the way I would do that through the node editor is I would hit Shift A, add in a texture, environment texture. Okay, and now you notice these nodes have different color kind of inputs and outputs. Generally, you want to connect like colors together. It's not always the case, but generally that's what you want to do. Uh, and each color means something. So. Green is a shader, um, so uh, the, the background shader, surface shader. Uh, yellow is color data, so right now it's gray. Um, then you have gray, which is a value, a number. could represent any number of things, but it's, it's generally just a numerical value. Uh, and then you have blue, which is a vector uh, value, uh, which is like UV coordinates, uh, things like that. So to add an environment texture in the UV uh, or in the in the node editor, I'd, I'd hit Shift A, add in environment texture, connect to the colors, and then click on Open, and I can navigate back to my train station uh, and go into perspective view, and there it is. Okay. And this is a, a an easier way to kind of see how things flow together. Uh, through the node editor. Uh, but right now, I'm going to delete that node. To, to delete a node, you just select it and then hit X, and it'll disappear forever. So that is how the node editor works. Oh, I'm going to zoom way in there. Okay, And so this is our diffuse shader. Uh, I'm going to now select my next set right here. I'm going to add in a new material, and I'm going to change the surface to glossy. Okay. Um, yeah. So glossy by default uh, is is very mirror-like, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we've got color options again, and we also have a roughness value, which is the roughness of the reflection. So if I move it kind of halfway or a little less than halfway, it looks more like a, a polished brass or copper type thing. Um, I can move it all the way to one, and it's it's still picking up light and reflecting it more, but you're not seeing any defined reflections in it. Or if I keep it at zero, then I've got really obvious and defined reflections. Uh, and there's a few different ways you can, uh, a few different settings for how it determines the glossiness. Um, we'll just keep it on Beckman, which is the default for now. Um, so that's glossy. Uh, and then let's choose the next set. Click New. And this time, let's choose, uh, let's go with anisotropic. Now, this immediately looks very similar, but it has one key difference. Uh, I'm going to go back to my glossy shader real quick, and I'm going to set the roughness to 0.2. Oops. Okay. Now I'm going to go to my anisotropic shader, 
and I'm going to set the roughness here to 0.2. Now, you can see the difference in what they're doing. The anisotropic is often used for things like um, brushed stainless steel, brushed aluminum, uh, things that give you linear highlights um, versus glossy will just give you a highlight as def defined by kind of the shape of the form. Um, so glossy, we've got a, a much more, I don't know, maybe bulbous um, highlight here, whereas with the anisotropic, it's more linear, uh, even on this rounded shape. <coughs> so that's anisotropic. Um, and you've got a few different options for how, how linear is that highlight. Um, you can also adjust the rotation, you know, which way it's, it's pointing. Um, plenty of options to play around with. Uh, continuing on, uh, w one note while I think of it, um, instead of clicking new, if I click on the, the material icon next to it, I can see all of my already created materials that are already in the scene, and I can choose those. Um, when I do that, I've got my material name, and I will. you'll also see a number pop up next to it. This number two represents the number of users of that material. How many objects have that material applied to them? Okay, if I want to make it its own material again, because um, right now if I adjust the color on this one, say I want to make it blue, it changes both of them. If I want to make it its own material uh, now, I can click the two, and now it's its own material, and I can adjust it as I want. Uh, so now I'm going to choose a translucent material. Uh, and translucent will let some light pass through it, um, but it's not, it's not the same as a glass texture or a transparent texture. Um, and I apologize, I don't know the exact, exactly how translucent um, works, but uh, play around with it and you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, it also can vary depending on, on the lighting that you have set up, how obvious the effect is. That is an ugly color. Let's find something a little bit better. Let's make it a little brighter. Uh, we'll go like here. Okay. So that's translucent. Uh, I'll choose the next one, new. And I'm just going to keep going down the line. Glass. Here's glass. Uh, and what this... Uh, glass introduces a new uh, number that we haven't seen before, and this is IOR. And what that refers to is the index of refraction. That refers to how much light is bent as it enters and leaves the material. So uh, as I increase this, if I go up to 2, uh, it doesn't get bent a whole lot at all. If I go down to... 1.1, it's, it's really heavily distorting. Uh, you especially can see it with the sphere, really heavily dis distorting the light that goes through it. Okay. Um, and different materials, different types of glass have their own index of refraction. Uh, and if I pull up in, I actually happen to have a list of that. Uh, and this is something else, else I will I will put on D2L. So uh, this is a list I found at one point uh, I th on one of the Blender forums, um, and it's a list of common material index indices of refraction. So air has an index of refract refraction of one. There is no refraction of light. Bubble of 1.1, water 1.333, uh, glass 1.44 to 1.9. You know, sugar, 1.56, uh, crystal, 1.87. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a handy list as you're trying to make things look uh, more realistic. And I, again, I'll put that on D2L. Um, so that's glass. Uh, up next, moving down the list, we've got... Uh, we're going to skip a couple of these. Let's look at the tune shader. And the tune shader... Um, is a uh, very much not a realistic shader, um, but if I set the color to, I'll say like a red, maybe. Okay. 
So I've got a couple of, of different options again that I haven't seen before. We've got size, and then we also have uh, smoothness. I'll bring the size up to 0.7 and I can adjust the smoothness. Uh, and what this will do is, is give kind of cartoon, almost cell shaded like uh, effects, uh, depending on what the settings are. Uh, they tend to be flatter um, shadings. It'll, you'll lose some detail with this. Now, but if you're going for a particular look or a particular effect, this can be um, very cool, very useful. Um, so, again, something is to, to play around with and, and get a feel for exactly how that works. Um, you can also have it be a diffuse tune or a glossy tune. And again, that will affect how everything uh, looks on it. So that's the tune shader. Uh, up next, we have. Uh, refraction, which is kind of similar to, to glass. Uh, we also have an IOR value that we can input, um, but it behaves a little bit differently. Uh, and we've got a roughness value that we can adjust as well. Uh, moving on, we've got, what's next? Uh, glossy we did. Velvet. Uh, Velvet's a weird one that I haven't, I haven't had a, a, a need for it, but uh, you can kind of see what it does. It it mimics velvet as you would expect um, by that name. You've got a sigma value that you can adjust, um, which will have, you know, a, a various effects on it. You change, change the color. You know, a lot of these. A lot of the controls are the same, and you just kind of have to keep adjusting it to, to get a feel for how each one works. Uh, next one we've got is subsurface scattering. This is a fun one. Uh, might be tough to see in this instance, but uh, subsurface scattering is what you would use uh, for skin. Um, and what it is is certain materials, skin, um, inside of an apple is another example of this. Certain materials, light will enter underneath the surface and then, as the name would indicate, scatter or get diffused underneath the surface. And it gives a, a, a unique look. Um, wax is another example that has subsurface scattering. Um, and so with, with this shader, we have a, a scale option and then we also have a radius option, um, which is divided into RGB values um, so if I go one and then two and then four, um, that's, oh, that looks a bit weird. Um, this is a, a shader that you either need to know exactly what you're doing to mess with or be closely following somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. And I have to say at this moment, I am not one of those, either of those people. So, um, but as you as you play around with it, you'll you'll get a feel for exactly how it works. Um, when you see a, if you've got a, a backlight on somebody and you see a little bit of the red in their ear, of the blood in their ear and the light shining through that, that subsurface scattering is how you achieve that look. Um, so that's, that's a subsurface scattering uh, option. You can adjust the scale as well. Um, we're kind of how thick or, or dense the object is. Um, okay, next we have. I did velvet. Ah, transparent. Here's transparent. It's exactly what it sounds like. You can choose the color and, and do with it as you will. Um, it's a fairly straightforward uh, shader. And then lastly, we have, what's the one that I haven't done that I actually want to cover? Background, refraction, tune, ambient occlusion, holdout glass, translucent. Ah, a mix shader, I believe. Oh, no, emission. Emission is the one um, which we over already covered with light, but just so you can kind of see it in conjunction with everything else. Um, Go with like a deep red, maybe. Did you do hair? Uh, I did not do hair. Um, 
hair shaders are a bit. I haven't I haven't worked with the hair shader with cycles. Um, I think I don't want to give you any misinformation about it. Um, but yes, you're correct. I did not do hair. Um, you are you are free to play around with it on your own. I I need to to do some work with it, and it's not something that most of you will have to worry about. Um, yeah. So let's actually set that to like five, so you can kind of see what that's doing. Okay. So looking back over our work, this is what we have: a bunch of different materials. Um, materials work in conjunction with lighting, and in conjunction with textures to achieve whatever desired look you're going for. Um, there is one actually. There is one other shader that I would like to cover. And up in my node editor, I'm going to choose back to go back to object uh, object nodes and make sure I'm on materials. And I'm going to let's choose the the glossy one. Uh, and I'm going to change the the op, uh, change the shader from glossy, and I'm going to choose mix. Okay. Now, when I choose mix, it actually gives me two more shader inputs. And this is going to be a lot easier to see up in the node editor. But this is how I can combine multiple shaders together uh, to get a desired effect. So in order to do something that, that you can obviously see, uh, I'm going to hit Shift A. And I'm going to add in a shader glossy. And I'm going to connect the green node to the first slot. And I'm going to hit Shift A, add in a shader. And I'm going to choose emission. And I'm going to connect that to the second slot. OK. I'll zoom in here and, and navigate around. OK. Uh, now, the mix shader also has a factor uh, value. And what that is is how much of each component is being brought into the final product. So if I go all the way to 0, it's all the glossy shader. If I go all the way to 1, it's all the emission shader. So I'm going to go back to 0.5, which is exactly halfway. And I'm going to change my glossy color to, uh, let's make it kind of a gold, maybe a little darker. And my emission, um, actually, you know what? Let's make the gold a little bit more orange. And I'll make the emission a little bit more, more yellow. Or. Yeah, we'll, we'll maybe go with that. Uh, and I'm going to change the strength of my emission up to, let's say, 5. No, that's too much. 2? We'll go 2. OK. So I can, I can also adjust my roughness as well. If I want it to be shiny and bright, that's tough to see, isn't it? Let's go something a bit darker, maybe. OK. There. So th there you can see. You can see the reflection in it. But you can also see that it is emitting light. Um, so you can mix. Oftentimes, I'll mix a diffuse and a glossy shader together um, to get a more realistic feeling material. Uh, and one last thing that I want to kind of cover and kind of whet your appetite for next week is with this factor value, you can see that it can receive an input. Um, so if I hit Shift A and go to Textures, I can input an image texture, texture, or I can input a, an environment texture, which is another image. Um, but I also have all these other kind of preset textures, um, generated uh, procedural textures. So if I choose a checker texture, uh, and then I connect the factors together, now what it's doing is it's applying this checker pattern to these objects. And one part of it is getting, the white is getting all of the glossy material, and the gray, which I should actually turn to black, is getting all of the emission material. Okay, and I can adjust the scale on the checker pattern however I want, um, and that's another way you can kind of dynamically control materials. So there's that's tip of the iceberg for how powerful the node editor can be, and, and ways that you can combine things. Um, and I can still all adjust these individually, give it more light, make the diffuse part a little bit, or the, the glossy part a little bit more, a little rougher. 
Um, so yeah, that is a, a brief overview of the materials and how you apply materials. Um, next week we will use materials in conjunction with textures and actually start making things that look like real things that exist in real life. Uh, so for those of you watching this that are actually in my class and not just random YouTube people, um, there's homework. Homework. Uh, uh, no, it's not over. We have 45 seconds. This still says 49. So uh, plus, you guys waste enough of my time. I can waste a minute of yours. Uh, so your homework, I will post this Evo 9 car uh, blend file on D2L. It's a, it's a model that I got from uh, BlendSwap, which is a, a website where people can upload blend files and you can just freely download them and use them as you wish, uh, depending on whatever license they have. Uh, but I will post this on there, and your task is to light this car and set up a camera. Um, you can set up multiple cameras and, and, and have different angles, um, but I want you to light the car. You'll probably have to add some sort of a background so you might add a plane, um, scale it up. And actually, a common thing to do, too, is to give it kind of a, a, a psych or an infinity background. So if I go to the side, or I guess it's front view, um, and kind of extrude it out and give it this kind of curved background, that's a common thing to do. And then I might add in a, oops, as a different object, add in a plane. Uh, move it up, rotate it, scale it, and give it a uh, emission material. I might make this light a little bit blue. If I go into rendered view and move that over, whoops, sucked to the wrong thing. Move that over. Um, if this is running a little slow for you, you can go into your scene settings and change your simplify subdivisions down to one, and that'll speed things up. Um, also, be mindful of your world settings. Um, you can set the background if you want to do an environmental uh, lighting setup as well. You can do that uh, and set your strength down. Uh, you might want to bring the strength down as well to something like 0.2. So play around with that. Get comfortable with lights and cameras and, and lighting objects uh, because for your actual projects, you will be lighting your projects. So um, there it is. You do not have to worry about materials.